is four maze codes for downtown. So this got introduced uh, two weeks ago with just, um, I think it was sort of um, a cursory look at the map. So this just came in this afternoon um, from Dodds and Flanker. What I had on the screen on another panel was sort of the map for us to focus on tonight. So it's really, the idea I think for tonight is to sort of really discuss the map of sort of what the recommendations would be to create sub-districts for central business architecture um, committee. I'm just gonna just turn this down, hold on just a second. Um, sort of talk about the map, whether the map makes sense, maybe adjust that, and talk about the differences between sort of the core district and there are proposed to be sort of three total districts, sort of the core plus two sub-districts. So see if that makes sense, and then if you want to get into the detail about sort of what that means. I didn't get a chance to see what they read. Wayne, I don't know if you looked at this at all. Right, I mean, it came in at 5 o'clock this afternoon, so I haven't had a chance to really look at what the recommendation was, was but they did um, send in sort of a draft coding, which I have on the screen also. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you're okay. Did you get my email? No. How do I do why? So um um there's some draft elements about uh, um what how we might change the current regulations or the regulatory structure for all of downtown. Right now we have the same use classifications and the same design guideline review from the Central Business Architecture Committee for the entire Central Business District. So the idea is do we focus those design guideline standards for uh, sort of the core historic district and then maybe have light design light for the side streets and, and entryway or not necessarily even design light but slightly different standards for those areas that aren't don't represent the core um, downtown district. So and it's worth noting though that if if we did this exactly the way the map show right now, central business would be much larger than this map. So some of the CBD is, that we're talking about here isn't covered by the central business. Right. So there. So one of the issues we've talked about with the consultants and they recommended is you know adding bits that are um, sort of. Um, complement the central business district that are currently zoned CB. Um, and we'll go through those. So um, I liked the color map. So I think maybe before we get into the coding, maybe we should look at the overall map. That's sort of where we finished the last time. This one is a little bit hard to read. So I did pull up the, um, I'm just going to go down here to see if they have the other map, which I think is easier to read, but um, you guys may, you can tell me otherwise. Um, so this shows, um, just to um, orient you, and then I'll get the colored map, which I think might be a little bit easier to see. What they've done is sort of um, use this solid black line as um, the primary spine, basically, for Main Street, right? It's um, goes from, um, okay. now I have to get more in, this is the rail it's trail. It's well, it's the, right, the existing boundary of central business, so it's half of historic Northampton's property, which mm -hmm. right now at City Council, they're going to adopt, um, you know, shifting this line over two lots, because that's also part of historic Northampton, and they come over here. But anyway, from that point on Bridge Street, where historic Northampton is, all the way up to State and um, South Street is sort of that main. And then what they're showing here is Main Street Secondary. But with the map, this is 
isn't entirely consistent with the math of the shaded parcels that we sort of be included in the core, because we did include sort of a section of Pleasant Street. I think is what we are talking about is sort of those that intersection here and having um, now this map is actually showing the public realm zones. So um, there are two different pieces to this. It's one sort of how you treat the streets and what kind of design um, standards we would have for the streets and the sidewalks and the street furnishing zones. And then the other piece is how the private realm works that are plot those streets. So um, I'm just a little um, back set here of catching up. I'm sorry, can you, can you just, what is the, what is the a business that I might recognize on Pleasant and Main Street? So Silver State Design so, so, would be okay. right there in that corner. Okay, great. And then the courthouse is right there. Great. Um, so, um, and Sweeties is on this corner. Okay, all right. Yeah. And then um, City Hall is um, up here somewhere. <laughs> in this um, section here, there's called um, the Academy of Music. It's over there. So the lightly shaded pink is the current downtown core district? Well, no, don't look at that. Okay. <laughs> because it doesn't include all of central business right now. There's a little bit of central business that, well, actually, I, you know, it's, I'm spinning a glare, so I'm not yeah. seeing it all. Um, <coughs> But as of right yeah. now, on King Street, I'm just going to go with this. I'm just going to go with King Street. The darker pink on King Street right now is every yeah. business that's right. not a central business. Right. right. On Pleasant Street, central business comes down to Hockman, which is the one that comes in at an angle. Yep. So there was a little bit of a dark pink. Uh -huh. And that is all the business. Right. But what this map is representing is their recommendation that we sort of treat these darker pink areas differently for the public street portion of it. So this is a you know entryway from the dike yep. here when you cross over by the bowling alley up to and they're going past talking them but to Holyoke Street. And then from and and Holyoke that's where the lumber yard is yep. and where um, yep. um, the opposite side is um, your former block. <laughs> Um, and then um, up here is um, no, this has been um, North. Is that Trumbull? Summer? Yeah, Summer. Okay. Yeah. Summer oh. Summer North. oh yeah, sorry, Summer. <coughs> um, sort of another gateway corridor. Yeah. But let me go back to. Um, and, and we touched on last week a little bit that um, those are the only two gateway corridors coming in from South Street from East Hampton isn't really a gateway, nor is Bridge Road, Bridge Street uh, a gateway, yeah. right? They are just central business right. ends, and then it's just. <clears throat> yeah, so that would be, so again, here's historic Northampton here, yeah. and this is Bridge Street going out. Um, the the um, school is back here, and this is a cemetery. So, right, there's no recommendation. The sort of their study area stopped at the edge of Central Business District. Um, so this represents. Oh, why this isn't showing up here? Let me see if I can do that. Oh, it does do a little bit. Here, let me see if I can. Uh, okay, I guess that's a little bit better. Um, so this is um, this is more about what it, where I started saying that these colorized areas are talking about are, are representing not this they coordinate with what the public realm standards would be but there's also this is really the map about where there's a recommendation for having um, distinct sub-districts within the central business district. So again, our CV goes um, up to this point now where the dark is, and and it goes um, down to Holyoke. Central business? 
I think GV picks up there okay. um, to hop in. I'm fairly certain. Okay. Um, and um, and then sort of this. Then there. So there are three. I don't know if you can see the three shades clearly on this one, but there's sort of the really dark pink is the core central business, and then this these lighter ones would be the gateways to the central business. And again, it, um, there are only minor expansions to the central business district that they've talked about, which would be, this is Holly Street here. So going down the edge of um, Holly Street down to Holyoke, except they didn't include that corner parcel, which I have to look at. I don't know why they did that. But um, right now there's office industrial down there. That's where the shoe fix place is. And it's just kind of. That's um, where the BF speakeasy is. What's that? The BF speakeasy. Oh, really? <laughs> um, and then there are other miscellaneous side streets that are currently in the central business zone, but they're treated the same as the dark um, pink right now in terms of design standards or regulatory review of any private projects that come in um, within the central business district. Um, and these are, and as Wayne said, entrance business and then general business down here, but the recommendation would be to treat these as the same sort of gateway districts or sub-districts of the central business. So then we would look at them differently in terms of review criteria for the buildings or um, you know, additions to structures or modifications to facades, they might be treated differently. So there had been some discussion, um, some preliminary discussion, I think two weeks ago, about what would be included in sort of the, the hardcore design review um, in the dark pink. So um, okay, I can go story, over this. Why is there that big one white island there amidst everything? Why don't we include that in This right here? Yeah. Well, so here's the um, naval walkway, right? Okay, yeah. And then this is, um, there's a condominium, yeah, yeah, condominium project here. It's not currently central business, it's urban residential C. So we haven't looked at expanding that. It's sort of set back off the street. Um, my, uh, Kingsley Avenue is mostly residential as well, sort of multifamily houses. But as we look out, 10, 15, 20 years, don't all of those become part of the opportunity to go commercial? Really? Yeah, sort of yeah thing I mean, I guess just expand. to kind of echo what George is saying, like, I guess I don't get, it seems like we're I'm, doing, like, what, 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 what are you looking for? Sorry, this doesn't look like city council. And they're in council chambers in the next building, the back building. Shooting. Sorry. Yeah, and so you want to go in um, those doors back there and then just turn right down. I'm sorry for interrupting. That's okay. Like, we're very aspirational about wanting to like change URB and URA and you know. But yeah, it seems like we're not being particularly aspirational as far as expanding the, the level of density and commercialization. Yeah, like, I mean, what are the like we're protecting like what's there, but like Kingsley Avenue, like a bunch of those structures are falling apart. At some point, they might come down, and someone might do another lumberyard type building, but. You know, they can't if it's URC necessarily, or maybe they could do something. But yeah, it just seems like a weird missed opportunity to kind of like embrace that. Like downtown is going to have to grow at some point. Like it's our only like dense, sustainable place for more housing and for transit-oriented stuff. Like, like it can't just be like the movie set of Main Street. Like that's like it seems like we're like protecting that as opposed yeah. to like aspirationally like even stopping at Hoyoke Street like Hoyoke Street's like close like close in like if you go to the tip top of that dark pink on further up on King Street yeah that's like way further than Hoyoke Street and then south of Hoyoke there's like the Keller Williams building which is traditional and dense and you know like it seems like we could we could hope for and zone for like that level of intensity below Hoyoke Street well, the idea about this, all this pink, um, is that we're just treating um, essentially the architectural standards differently and maybe the use standards. So in the dark pink right now, we say, 
commercial has to be on the street face. Yeah. Up to a depth of, you know, we have 30 feet now. And then behind the street face, you could do residential. So what the lighter pink would represent is still central business, mm -hmm. but maybe we have different standards. Maybe you could do a fully, um, you know, uh, residential all the way to the street face. And you still have the 70 foot height and you still have the um, zero setbacks and um, uh, essentially zero open space mm -hmm. for those areas so that, um, you know, we can look at that. Does it make sense? I mean, so it doesn't really necessarily have to be that there would be a reduction in density, mm -hmm. but it's really about where do we want to apply design standards where we want to protect the architectural character of that core Main Street, the movie Pleasant Street, yeah, yeah the movie set. Um, I mean, we still want design standards. Yeah. The point yeah. isn't to eliminate the design standards, but it's maybe to treat them differently because historically they've been different. So we have different architectural styles for the further right. away we get from Main Street and Pleasant Street. Can you just go back and say how this is different from what CBAC does now? Yeah, so right now, all of the pink, except for, you know, this is general business district, but yeah. basically all the, the really dark pink and then this lighter pink in here is all central business. So the design guidelines apply to everything the same way. The Central Business Architecture Committee does have discretion just to look at a project. Um, you know, oh, let's take the lumber yard for example. Yeah. The um, that is clearly there starts to be a much more eclectic mix of architectural character mm -hmm. as you're going down Pleasant Street. So, but however, the design standards say any new building should be themed commercial building. And so that means first floor has a lot of glazing and it should be a storefront kind of right. facade with the different the, um, the step backs mm -hmm. and bay projections. And then above that, you know, you have to have a certain patterning that reflects the historic character of theme commercial on Main Street and Pleasant Street. Right. So that's an example of where the Central Business Architecture Committee had a hard time wrestling with is modern okay here? Is a different style than theme commercial? Is it okay here? And certainly you don't want to match the 1970s or 50s mansard that's right. next to it. Right. Um, but the Central Business Architecture Guidelines, the way they're written now, yeah. say take in the context of the neighborhood. Well, there's some huge yeah. differential, you know, different architecture in that. So right. does that does that really make sense right. to say? you know, theme commercial or match what the closest building is, which is this two-story 1950s or 60s building. So the idea really is, so so they've been working with in this context, and every time we add bits to the district because we want to um, allow more density and expansion of commercial opportunities, especially on the edges where it provides lower cost you know, entryway, entry, yeah. entrance to businesses to be able to do startups and mm -hmm. things like that. Every time we do that on the edges, those, many times, those buildings are transitional residential or they're not quite like Main Street, but yet once you pull them into central business, then it's going to be, that's the platform from which the Central Business Architecture Committee is working to evaluate modifications to those buildings. So we feel like it's time now to think about, well, what are the forms that we want to make it feel like it's downtown and intense and dense, but from an architectural review standpoint, does it make sense to just try to do replication mm -hmm. of what the 1800s Main Street buildings look like? Is, is there a cost, you know, like, I mean, they might be rented tomorrow, but like, the, build, the commercial space that they did in uh, what was the Northampton Hotel, the whatever the... Oh, uh, where? Live, live, one, live 155 is now? Yes, Live 155. Yeah, Live 155. I don't know what it's 
so, so, uh, so <laughs> uh, those places are not working. Right. And so I'm just wondering, because like, there's a cost component. Like, if I buy one of these houses and then I have to make it look very nice, which I think you know it does. There's value to that because it makes our city look nicer. But it also means that by definition, I have to get a certain amount of certain rent for the for the cost. So I think we have to be real careful about putting these things in place because these startups that we talked about, I'm guessing the, the, the live one fifty five commercial spaces are not startup prices. I don't know when that one I mean I think you're right. I think from what I understand all new construction is over the top in March. <laughs> yes. So I don't think that even if you're, I mean, any new construction is going to mean that you're going to have to demand a certain rent. Um, so I'm not so sure that the design criteria in and of themselves is what's going to drive up the, the cost. Um, I'm just saying, but, I think it's something that we should be cognizant yeah. of. Yeah, I, I, like, yeah. I, mean, I like the notion of having, you know, one of the problems with downtown, as I understand it, uh, is for the commercial spaces, the prices are astronomical. Yeah. And, you know, there's a value in having what made the town cool was the, the, at one point in like this or 80s, it sounds like, there was cheap places that, that like faces could move in and right. make good money having a retail space. And so I, I just think that we need to try to create that. I'm not sure how we do it, but. Well, on the flip side, I mean, that's a really, like, incredibly interesting point because we're talking about design and form in an environment where traditional storefront retail is in its death spiral. We know it. And so to what extent are we going to try to mandate that kind of form, you know, or do we say that, that there's, a, there's another kind of design that would be feasible where there isn't as much glazing or you know I mean it's like we should be thinking about that like if we're kind of codifying storefronts that are going to end up vacant that's maybe not the greatest to me, idea. That, continue on with George was talking about that white island to me like a CB white uh, form yes that white island would be a spot for that and if this is if this is a projected view of what we're where we're trying to go, just to leave that. If it doesn't lend itself right now to to changes, I get that. But if we're trying to say this is this is the direction we want to head, I don't know what the downside of incorporating that island into the mix. If it was a again CD light where it doesn't have to necessarily be commercial empty storefronts on the first floor or whatever. Yeah. If the light pink allows commercial but doesn't require it. I think in the white, you can find a lot of people who are nervous. In the white pink is enough commercial. People wouldn't mind commercial if it happened. Who wouldn't mind it all residential? I think the white would get a lot of pushback from people who really want, don't want their neighborhoods to start to come Right. But I think, but sort of speaking to that, sort of obviously we need more residential to support the commercial core, right? Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, I think it would be interesting. So I could put up the, um, maybe be helpful to put up the aerial photo. You can see that in this scenario in particular, um, the buildings are back here and there's all parking here and then there's really nothing towards the front. And in the current- That's urban, Randolph um, uh, Yes. Um, so, is that what Carolyn's doing? That a lot of the white is floodplain and rivers, which is small. I mean, there's still a substantial amount of land there, but at least the center third or something. Yeah, because Town Street again is one of those transitional streets that bit by bit is becoming more commercial. Right. The retail stores, yeah. so some of those residential uh, I mean, homes may yeah. be sold. There's also <coughs> a moment where like. If you live just close to downtown, like that's where you live. Like if you want to live in a neighborhood, you've got oodles of acreage in Northampton that's very suburban. If you live on Wilson Ave and it's too crowded for you, there's options. Like 
I mean, it, you know, to, to limit like that commercialization seems short-sighted. Um, so that would be, um, right here. So this is Randolph Place. So you can see this is all parking here and all the residential is back here. Under the current, I mean, the benefit, I guess, of sort of thinking about sort of forward thinking in the future of maybe making this a central business light, maybe it doesn't make sense to do commercial here, but maybe central business, I mean, we've changed the urban residential C um, standards, but they're not nearly as liberal as central business in terms of density and height. So, you know, maybe there's a point where you don't need all this parking and you can put an infill building here, but it doesn't have to be commercial, maybe it has to be maybe be residential. And this is that row, I mean, this is Randolph Place right here, but all of this is parking that's all part of this parcel. What is the big, what is the big building that looks like with all this? Yeah, what's that? That's, that's Live 155. That's Live 155. Yeah, so the yeah. bike path is right here. Um, yeah, so that's all solar. So there, there's a new crosswalk there, but this is that white block. I didn't know there was all this. I didn't know there was all this forest back there. But this is the white block. Or this block. is because this is the old Mill Riverbed. But so that will never be built. That's the white block to the Wilson Wilson Street. Avenue, right. Yeah, Wilson so Avenue. behind, this is the Maplewood shops here. Okay. And then that, so that's commercial, and this is part of the white block because it's all residential tucked in here, Wilson Ave. Maple Ave here. Yeah, remember, the area of town is looking at, we currently allow about 17 dwelling units per acre. So it's certainly not as dense as we allow downtown, yeah. but it's, you know, a respectable dense. And what's that thing down at the bottom? Right yeah, that. That's, that's Smith or Ralph. Yeah. Yeah. Right. It's certainly not a I mean, the part that I think you're most persuasive about is that little gap on Pleasant Street. <laughs> yeah, right. The gap probably shouldn't yeah. have central yeah. Yeah. And even if this turns over, I mean, those are sort of low density for an urban district. They're sort of two-story, you know, townhouse kind of residential here. So yes, if you wanted to take this and build up, that would certainly create an opportunity, you know, like this, right? That's. But I think I mean that's been our fear, the planning board's fear in the past about making too many changes. Is that a surprisingly moderate income area? So we've been worried about adding so much value that we're getting gentrification. You know? right. Well, that's what happened with Smith College, right? When they did the engineering building, similar mm -hmm. kind of transitional area. Yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, different only in the sense that, I mean, yes, exactly the same kind of area, different because Smith has more money, you know. Yeah. It wasn't investors. So I don't think investors were to turn over that neighborhood. <clears throat> right. uh, and, and I guess the other thing is it's like, Besides being fear about losing moderate income housing, the extra density you get by adding the general business to the south, you know, drop in parking requirements, and the entrance way to the to the north is probably going to add more density than the market wants for a long time. So it's not that we're limiting that density. Yeah, I think it probably just makes it looks more obvious because it's that white pocket in the middle, even though there may not be that much opportunity. And it's, it's also true that it's a, well, at least as long as I've been here in Northampton, and I know it's probably since you've been here, the zoning has changed incrementally based on shifting parameters or things that are happening. So I don't, I also think that um, even if you adopt this form based code, that's, um, that, um, might have this with sub-districts, that doesn't mean that five years from now when we see that, oh, there's really pressure for more residential development or we didn't provide enough that you couldn't go through. But I think, you know, what Wayne is saying is this is all, this area, even though it's um, general business now, if we add it to central business, it, came, it, allowed, it creates more density, more opportunities for um, redevelopment at a higher density. I mean, one of the litmus tests for me is we know that Parker Pellet Group has done a lot of housing in Amherst. We know they've looked in North Angeles. And in any of those pink areas, I think it would be great if they can. That's a great yeah. density. I guess I'm just more nervous in that white area. Again, ignoring the frontage on Pleasant Street, I'm just I'd be more nervous at that kind of density on King's Lane. 
they're the national firm that builds large student housing. They were really just Amherst. Yeah, they're a local firm. Oh, yeah. And they've done like four projects in Amherst and they've <coughs> touched a nerve because each project, they're, they're feeding off like the like faculty, the, the research, uh, now that UMass is such a research center, faculty come in for two years. They don't want to buy anything. They don't want to stay in student house. They want a nice place to live for two years and then they're gone. And, and, and they, there's, there's a, a need for that because they, they keep open. So. It, it, it just strikes me, you know, often we hear about that boogie man and the spot zoning. I just, so this little piece here, our residential lot, and I, I just foresee where a developer that property does flip here, she wants to do something commercial, but they have to come to the zoning board to get a zoning change on that, perhaps those pieces. Um, so, uh, well, this is the Housing Authority property yeah. down here. That? So that is. Um, this is a Murphy okay, Realtor. Yeah. It's just what, and I know we try to make it. Part of what we try to do is make it easy for developers or yeah. for people coming in to understand our zoning and our maps. And um, the, I mean, I think the logic has been the mature, healthy mid-range housing market. It's sort of, you know, there's enough trend to, you know, Pleasant Street has a lot of schlock along it, where things go. There's enough schlocky areas where we'd love to get someone to tear it down and build a new building that it didn't seem worthwhile going into, you know, sort of healthy neighborhoods. That, and especially because you can still, uh, again, because we allow 17 12 years breaker, it's not like we're trying to prevent development there. We're just not going to have a unlimited book. Yes, there have been pushback from developers. In, if you go back to that pink uh, map, in the, the mid pink range, I guess, um, from developers who are, are being beholden to the central business architectural guidelines, but they're not on Main Street, they're on off off street. And as a bit pushed back by we can't we should or we should be uh, uh, conforming to the same regulations and so forget it, I can't do my development or has there been we much of that? Well, so the only ones that I mean we only know about the ones that come forward for a permit, right? right? So there could be people out there that look at those criteria and say, oh, I don't want to go through that, that we don't know about. But um, in my uh, conversations with people who have an idea of a project who are coming forward, I mean, I talk to them about the fact that they're not on Main Street. And, and the guidelines are flexible enough to say, if you're a transitional residential building, like the Osaka block, right? Those are all, res those aren't being commercial. And there have been some modifications. So the regulations actually allow for that type of structure to be treated differently. So already built in, there are some, there's a level of um, allowances for that. In fact, the building, Another example is you guys reviewed it too, um, and some of us reviewed it. You know, behind the Bella restaurant next to Woodstar, that two family that they came yes. in and they wanted yeah. to convert it yeah. to yeah. residential. Right? Yeah. They, yeah, they, yeah, they withdrew that that project died. So that's an example of a building set back, and the Central Business Architecture Committee had no problem with approving that without a ground floor. Um, you know, facade. Yeah. But, uh, but there's a level of risk. We, remember we hired, who's the real estate firm we hired three or four years ago? Um, I can't remember. Right. So we hired a real estate firm with the Office of New York in LA yeah. and we said, it is more about the edge of downtown than downtown itself, but we said, why aren't we getting more housing downtown? Look at Amherst who's getting it, look at Denver who's getting it, why aren't we getting it? And you know, their main focus was sort of the uncertainty. That, yeah, you're gonna get a firm, we, I'm not sure anyone ever gets turned down, but you were going to go elsewhere, you know, it's going to scare away some people. And, you know, the lumber yard went through various iterations mm -hmm. before they got a permit. They also got appealed. So, but Valley CDC is in the community. They're not leaving. So, you know, they were, you know, Joanne will probably kill me for saying this, but, you know, they don't like the risk but they're also in it for the long term, so they were willing to 
put in the time and the effort. And, and um, they are in the dark red where we're talking about the least amount of change. So right. those are the core areas. It's not that we want to change the standards there. Yes. What is the, the places that are more marginal? Right. Paul History is a good example. Someone is right. a lumberyard lumber building. It's affordable housing, so it's a little different, but you can imagine a building you're penciling out. I can't really imagine the same sort of investment penciling out in Paul History. Right. But I mean, so what is the, is, what is the risk that people, is, is the risk you're saying that is the risk that there's not enough people to pay $2,500 a month for a one-bedroom apartment. What, what, is, what, is the, what is the risk? Well, it's the risk for not getting a permit, for get, either getting turned down or having to go to court, and that extends your costs, your right. timeline for development, and then your costs. I mean, I don't, is that a problem in this city? Yeah, I think for investors that that's the uncertainty. Yeah, it's one thing costs are what the costs are. Building is expensive, yeah. and once you get to the point, at least you you know when you get the money in. But if you spend a hundred thousand dollars and walk away with nothing, for but I just think of Amherst is like a thousand times worse. <laughs> and reality, so I, I'm but saying so like what is so is it, it, it is what we're saying that they have more money, so they. But of course, the Eric, I mean, a lot of people hate the archipelago design. Right? And so in some ways we're saying, we'd like to do that, we'd just like it. We'd still like to do better design than Amherst. No, no, I, mean, I, I get that. I, but I, what I'm saying is that Amherst, I mean, the horror stories, I, I mean, every contractor I know right. literally adds 15% to, mm -hmm. to doing work at Amherst because dealing with the, the building inspectors there is right. so horrible. I mean, that's fantastic. Amherst had had a stronger down, uh, housing downtown engine than we do, or a weaker yeah. retail engine than we do. So, you know, yeah. they somehow made it work. Yeah, that's, that's, that's what I'm trying I'm just sort of trying to understand the risk relative yeah. to the horror stories that I've heard. Well, let's see. Here, there's another real-life example. At the corner of Olive Street and South Street. That, I mean, that's not downtown, but sort of that, that required a special permit. We say that. The, um, applicant put thousands of dollars into design, came back and back and back, and now, and then he walked. So that's the kind of thing that someone is going to be afraid of. And it's not that the planning board wasn't necessarily going to give a permit, but it kept getting extended and extended. And then there was the threat of the neighborhood suing. I mean, that was very, well, that was vocalized pretty clearly, I think, through the hearing process. So that's the thing that people don't want to take on. They want a project, they know they can, in the end, they know what the finish line is and they can get there. And yes, maybe in Amherst, there's, the finish line is really hazy in front of them. But, um, uh, and, and that's not what we're suggesting we do here. We want, and in fact, we want to even make the lines clearer so we can say, this is exactly the line here, and if you do this, maybe you can do it by right. Maybe you don't have to do design review, or maybe there are other pieces of this paint where, because it's not so, we don't want to have such stringent architectural review, that maybe in these other areas we can have it by right. It just goes to the planning board, and this, the design is much clearer. And then that way, that loosens a little bit of this up and reduces some of the risk for those um, developers. So it seems like there's two problems. There's the first problem is, and like to a certain extent, like making it stricter is not a bad thing. Because making it stricter is saying, as long as you have, and this is sort of like blue siding and uh, and two white columns, you can build you can build what you want. The builder can then decide that that's perfectly fine. So I mean, I almost wonder, like, if to a certain extent, making it sort of loosey goosey, like, is worse yeah. Yeah, yeah, than, right. than just right. we, we putting it all dark. Right. All, all dark. Yeah, right. we want you to spend the money in the building and not be uncertain. Yeah. And, and frankly, it also shows up. We know that there are crazy landlords in town who price things in an odd way. And one of the problems with uncertainty is. When you're buying land, you don't know what the cost will be. To some extent, you're going to spend more money on the land, and you know it. You know it's going to cost me X dollars. You negotiate and hopefully get the land at the right price. You get a surprise six months into the process. You know, Lumber Yard had this huge surprise for a sewer line. They, in retrospect, should have bought the property for half a million dollars less. 
Yeah, I mean, I, we don't have to do the sewer line, but yeah. it's, it's uncertain right. where it's project. Well, and they also had no idea that there was going to be, they were going to have legal battles right. on the, through that process. Um, and we tried to be, some, but that's also an example of one where they came to the Central Business Architecture Committee with their own interpretation of what the requirements were, and then the Central Business Committee said, no, you didn't quite get it right, so they had to sort of go back, and, and, and that's, I mean, that's, they were doing their job, but I think there are some areas where it makes sense that we can make the job easier for either central business architecture or maybe take it out of central business architecture and put it to planning board because they don't need that same level of scrutiny. Right. At a certain level, it shouldn't be open to interpretation. Yeah. Right. The developer right. should say, if I meet yeah. this criteria, it might be hard to do that, but if I do, I know it's going to get approved. Yeah. Versus like the lumber yard getting to that point and then central business saying, well, you almost got it, but you got to do it again. Right. Like, what were the major you mentioned Valley City. You say, I mean, you know, remember their appeal was only about site plan and central business architecture. After the Go West bill was appealed, and that was held up for two years during the appeal, Joanne said she's never going to apply for a project that requires a special permit. So their risk was at least less. Central business architecture, they could have lost a year if they would have gone to court. They would have won. I mean, you know, it was the delay that hurt Valley and cost them the final outcome. Whereas Go West, it was potentially this case, though, she wouldn't do that again. Where's Go West? So the other thing, and speaking of the special permit, I just had a meeting with someone who's done dabbled in development in Northampton, mm -hmm. and they bought a new project, not in downtown, but on the edge, you know, in the URC district. And now we have that threshold between six units being site plan and seven or more being special permit. As soon as it sounded like he was going to throw him into special permit, he just said, I'm not doing that. I'm not doing special permit. I'm only doing site plan. I can't do this project. If you're going to make me do special permit, I'm just going to figure out a plan to do like twice as many units and just cram them in because the special permit is such well, an issue. Well, and go back to that white area. If we really want more density in the white, this is separate from central business, but if we really want more density of air, drop in the special permit requirement. I think would be good. that was really a political compromise, but that's what we really get that area. Yeah. So can I, I mean, all I know about this a special permit is from, the, from two two meetings that I have a, a month. So what, like, what this this or like, what is the horse? Because I mean, I feel like people come in. Forget what happens to you guys. I mean, you process is difficult. You're horrible, but you know you can get yeah. permit. Okay. But it is really easy to appeal a special permit and delay something for two or three. And the best special permit, it doesn't matter that one. Like a resident, like a, a neighbor can yeah, do that? Yeah. Neighbor. Uh, yeah. Yeah. That's really the killer. So to me, that's the solution. I mean, much of this is getting, solving that problem. Absolutely right. Yeah, so the, the issue is the courts um, pay greater scrutiny to special permit projects and their decisions than for site plans. So there's a much more, the courts give much more discretion to the planning board for site plan because it's considered a by right project, it's just about a technical review. Whereas special permit is the board can say yes or no, so they're gonna really sort of look at that and it and potentially it takes longer than a site plan review. So if we had, if we put this stuff into the dark tank, would we be limiting those losses? So central business architecture is potentially a little more discretion than site plan review, mm -hmm. but nothing like special permit. So it scares away some investors, but not, you know, Joanne was delayed, well they ended up settling, so it's not a good test. But special permit is really the killer. So we just have to limit, when we look at this map, the real thing we should be looking at is just getting rid of the special permit. Yes. It's getting rid of the special permit, but the other thing to think about is potentially you know, Central Business Architecture Committee likes the setup and they like to have review, even though they acknowledge that there's different subdistricts that make sense for them to have a different type of review or more discretion or sort of a broader range of flexibility in the architectural form and style and um, elements. <coughs> However, they still would like to have review in these areas. So then the real question is going to be, if these really, if we're acknowledging and this is the right boundary, which I think is important for you all the way in, this makes 
sense for the right boundary, um, should then we sort of shrink the central business architecture review's jurisdiction so that it really just comes to planning board so that there's a one-stop shopping for those design elements and <laughs> the buildings instead of continuing to have two permit processes for the entire boundary. So do you mean like CB light would be planning board? Potentially, Administrative yeah. review and, and CB would be architectural? Right, and then maybe there's some pieces within that even that would be staff review. Right. You know, if they're so prescriptive that... It, it yeah. seems like if you just have, if you're in CB light, you have to do conform to these 10 things. If you go to CB, it's these 14 things. You know, and so there's a prescription that it gets a little, but it's clear, it gets yeah. a little harder, but but it would be so for, these are the architectural elements that, that the central business architectural board should be looking at in central business, they would maybe not see the light. Right. And you can even add another layers, you know, you want incredible creativity. So Gary comes in and wants to design, you know, whatever Gary uses for metal. Maybe that's, if they don't meet the cutting edge, the, the automatic prescriptive standards, then they can go to central business right. architecture. It doesn't happen often, yeah. but at least we're saying we're allowing that. Just like a background question, I mean that like all makes good sense. So, like if that's so logical, why isn't that how it's been? Like, what what was the rationale for how central business architecture? We sort of have that. I mean, to some extent, yeah, like it's pretty that, prescriptive. It's like, pretty prescriptive, but it, it's because we keep doubling the size. So central business architecture okay. made perfect sense when it was core downtown. Mm -hmm. We expanded, and it made some sense. Mm -hmm. I think it still made sense. You know, is the lumber yard? I mean, the, the actual yeah. just within the district where's the edge? But now, if we went all the way down to Dyke and all the way up from North Street, we're right. doubling the size. Right. That may no longer make sense. So, what's the what's the trade-off between like codifying this in in like a form-based code versus architectural review guidelines that are? I guess it, I mean it just seems like there's a lot of ways that it could be implemented. Yeah, well, you could do either way. I mean, we sort of say what we have is in some ways right. a form-based code. Right. One of the things that drove this was also think about the public realm piece. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we're, we've been trying to close curb cuts on Main Street. Right. We closed one, we're trying to close another one. Right. I don't, you know, but you have one set of standards that covers all of that. Right. There's nothing in central business architecture that talks about right. how do you rebuild the sidewalks. So right. some of it's adding that. Right. Okay. And frankly, this is all right. So that's totally the entree right. to take this out of yeah. C back. That's yeah. That makes perfect sense. The, the other secret goal we have mm -hmm. is we thought form based code downtown would be easier because we are so close, mm -hmm. and so we sort of hope we could build momentum because mm -hmm. as we go into neighborhoods, it's not so easy. Right. And so this changes that program. Mm -hmm. Okay. So <clears throat> just a process question: When does the Chamber of Commerce, which they're often very interested in feedback on um, things like this. When do they weigh in or have they already? So who started? So so at Peter and Dylan did a presentation before Chamber of Commerce's economic subcommittee uh -huh. and before focus group ushers on it of the DNA. All right, right. So they've been part of the conversation. You know, for the most part they are not developers. So the store owners is really what dominates them and they for the most part don't really care. Uh, but at least we're we're certainly keeping them. <clears throat> and now this new director, and I don't know him. I mean, Suzanne understood these right. issues. I don't know. Um, so I think, you know, I don't think we're going to get down to the code level detail. But if maybe we could um, sort of, if you think this map makes sense, maybe the next phase would be to then give you ahead of the meeting sort of what that means in terms of coding. What could, what would be the potential changes to the lighter paint area and the gateways, um, and does that make sense? So, so just, just to clarify, is the dark paint the before and the medium paint is the after proposed? Or is, you know, what, what where, yeah, do, we, well, where so, do things stand now relative so where, to? Basically, this is all the current central business boundary now. Okay. Except for on Pauley Street. Uh, right, except for down yep. here. Yep. It goes, this is Office Industrial and Sub York. This is like spotty in here. 
And that's from CFO. So that's residential. So, right. But so but we're taking we're taking the whole and we're squishing CV down tighter and making it a perimeter district. But C V light is bigger. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And then we're adding which we would change this from entrance business to gateway. Yep. And then general business to gateway. And, and those 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 changes also have a major impact on reducing the parking requirements. Which we're getting some pushback on. Great. Oh I'm sure. Yeah, I'm sure. Yeah. But wasn't there something about Parking requirements in that CV. I think what he was saying street. is where there's parking. So where there's public park, park. we don't have any place where we prohibit parking. We just don't require parking. Right. So okay. the standards were if you're going to park in. There are yeah. a two. I think there are two uses where we do require more parking. Yeah. And it's for movie theaters or entertainment or something. And then um, I forget what the other. There's a second one. But otherwise. No new development or uses require parking. And that's going to be side street. In everywhere right now. Okay. And the idea is not to change that. Okay. Um, but we're going to, just be clear, we're going to get a lot of pushback, particularly with the lumber yard and the right. 155 Live. We certainly hear the people in the chamber saying, oh, this is horrible. It's going to So I would say we're not requiring parking. I'm sending yeah. send a different message, but just know you're what, what, is, what, are, what are they not like? They don't like parking. So, so 125 Live has almost no parking, three or four spaces, and there's seven tenths of a spot per unit in the lumber yard. Piece. And they're just worried about the spillover in the neighborhoods. So it's yeah, it it discouraged at all. Yeah. But you also heard in your planning board process, they had a very clear calculation of what their clientele typically yeah. had for cars, and so they didn't even. They weren't even showing that they would fill the demand for the spaces they were going to provide here. And they also have, you know, they own the mill bank properties down here, somewhere in here. Um, and their spaces aren't full there. And, and the reality is, even though we have really high occupancy for city owned spaces, parking hasn't risen, the cost of parking hasn't risen enough to get private sector solutions. Yeah. Right. If I need parking for my offices, there's no incentive for me to rent at night because I can't sell it for much. And so I really want that to be to rise enough that Fitzwilly says, hey, give us X dollars a month. Actually, I think I do do it, but other people don't <laughs> do it. Right. 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 I, I think so much of this it, it, it has, like, that's the one thing that really needs to be thought of is just what are some parking rules? Because I think if you came at this type of thing and you said, maybe again, this would my experience was the one project that I was doing on Myrtle Street, Myrtle Street, it was like driving me insane that I like literally had people who really continue to park where they shouldn't park. And it turns out the police just do not like to deal with it. Because it they like and there's yeah. like you had to call the police, they would come, they'd never had to take a book, so they'd leave, you know, but maybe the person had already gone. You know, it was the type of thing where I mean, I had someone park in my driveway once. I mean, it was just a, right. yeah, yeah. But the point is, is that, is that I think that if we move forward, and part of moving forward was a parking plan that connected, that said, you know, two-hour parking or three-hour parking in these areas, except for if you have a you know, a presidential sticker, you know, that, those types of things. If there was that, if that was there, then that would stop some of the blowback that you're yeah, going to get. I agree. It's not as easy. Like, you know, this came up, we had a series of meetings on um, Graves Ave, and they complained about the streets being all parked up. And so we suggested residential only parking with parking meters, so you could have one or the other, you had a sticker or a parking yeah. meter. And then suddenly they said, oh, never mind, we don't want to do that because it's too much of a headache to get a pass. Right. 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 So, you know, and I, I think I get it now after <laughs> 50, uh, 55 minutes. So there's got to we'll be. We'll take as long as it needs. Uh, okay. Um, no, please. So we're shrinking that CBAC, what did you call it, uh, CBAC? CBAC. Yeah. Yeah. Are we going to get pushback from them if we propose that? Is Probably. there a fee stone that they. Do you think they're gonna walk, we're gonna water down kind of the architectural? Yeah, I mean, I'm not so sure I would categorize it as a fiefdom. I think they feel that the design guidelines are valuable for the city, 
and they think that they've made a difference in these projects. So I think they they feel that it's very important to maintain their jurisdiction for that purpose. Um, but I think it comes down to the details. What does it mean if we extract these areas from their jurisdiction? If we show them this prescription for what those guidelines are, they may feel completely differently. I mean, the way that it was initially pitched to them. So we took this map, or Dylan and Peter came to the Central Business Architecture Committee and said, okay, here's what we're thinking, we want to do these sub-districts, where do you think your jurisdiction should lie? And they look at that and they think of their current context of what they reviewed and how a posit what positive benefit they provided on projects and therefore for the city. And they thought that was good, we should keep that. So, but that that was the extent of the conversation. It wasn't, oh, but here's this set of criteria where right. if we extract you from review, this is what will happen in its place. I see. So, okay. And are they going to weigh in on that? I mean, are they going to help develop those design, those specific criteria? I think that what, I think the way it would work is we would do it at staff level in consult with Peter and Dylan and then take it to some of and say, hey, what do you think about this? Mm -hmm. um, and the same way we would take it to you all and yeah. say, what do you think about this? And some are easier. I mean, one of the special permits, because special permits are the worst part. Right. One of the special permits you issue is, we have what, a 10 foot maximum setback? And you want to get five. five. Okay, if you want to go more than five feet, you need a special permit. We want buildings on the sidewalk. Right. And so they're talking the standard for what would a little plaza look like, right? If you have, if you have a dead parking spot, Obviously, we don't want the building 20 feet back. We're on a suburban location. But if you're going to put benches in and make a vibrant place, that's great. You don't need to see that. Right. And so if we can spell this out, you know, so what are the equivalents for design issues? Right. Does it even have to explain to me why it's important to have a building right up near the driving section when we have such bad weather with snow? Yeah, I want people mostly describe it. Start thinking of it as, as walls in your living room, downtown to your living room. You sort of want that, that sense of enclosure of people like. We used to send interns out with um, counters and mm -hmm. literally measuring where people stopped walking and a parking lot that was very short. Actually, classy parking for our rehab. Yeah. There's far more students coming from the college from across the street to avoid classy park and then cross back because they liked life. People like this sort of thing. That's what we were saying on that presentation for Florence. Right, I didn't know. Yeah. All those parking, all these giant gaps. Yeah. Right. Don't really lose the walls of right. living rooms. But your concern is valid because the plows come by in the winter right. and the, the building's right up to the sidewalk, it becomes, is that right, just getting at there? Yeah, because I'm up in Florence enough in the wintertime that the newer building that the... Um, well, let's not even there. talk about that. No, I know. That's 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 no, I understand, but, yeah, that's but that's yeah. close that's to the... Part of the challenge is how wide is the sidewalk. Yeah. Uh -huh. If you have a really narrow sidewalk, which Florence does. Right. And it doesn't work, but it's not the one who's going to space apart the side of it. So you can build it back and wipe the sidewalk. And wipe the sidewalk. And then you're right. going to have to put their yeah. stuff. Yeah. Or have to put the tree down. I mean, I don't know if you should come downtown in the winter. Yeah. I mean, yeah. yeah. So, I mean, think about when you're walking downtown in the winter, the sidewalks are clear. I mean, the other piece that may be hard to think about. They push it, though, in the middle of the middle, right? Yeah, which so is fine. You see across your right. side. Yeah, but, but the other thing that we're doing now is we just signed this contract for a million dollars to design, redesign Main Street say this way. But to think about all those, how do you make it more livable in the, you know, the right of way? So does that mean adding bike lanes or sidewalk width or maybe section of width? So that's happens to be another piece that's going to be part of this equation, but we need to work on this first, and then, um, but, you know, the whole idea is to create that outdoor dining room or living room, I guess I should say, um, and make it feel like it's a comfortable place for you as a pedestrian as you go from building to building. And we even look at just, you know, deep in the weeds, minor things of like, how do we get sandwich board signs two feet off the ground mm -hmm. so that they're, yeah, they're real estate for snow and be there. Because all this things have to have. Karen, can you expand on that for a second? Um, I guess as big as you can. So the top left, the light pink, how, yeah, in there, how, did, where, how is so it determined? Is that 
Yeah. Yeah. How is it determined as we're as we're contracting the central business? How is it determined? So where does go over there too? Does that make sense? Yes. Some of the other buildings. Bridges for buildings. Yeah. Not always. Yeah. Obviously, the buildings pop around. Right. But well, that, the great buildings are continuous facades. Right. And then we sort of bounce, narrow down the street. So, the police station right there where your thumb yeah. was? Yep. So, um, police station is here. That's the parking garage. And then here's the hotel with a Gothic Street here. And, um, so, if you go back to this. So, that's in um, basically in this area beyond the. I mean, this would be. Um, urban outfitters here, so this is um, the parking, deck. parking yeah. deck right here, and then the People's Institute back here, and it goes on up to this is that um, office block, um, six what is that six yep. block right. office? Right. Right. Oh, right. Didn't, okay. didn't, okay. we, didn't we allow some banking? Right here. Right there. Yeah, the yeah. 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 So one of the themes we had going back to Central Business Architecture, whatever it was 15 years ago, was we didn't want those wood frame buildings, we call transitional residential, to become parking lots. But we were fine with them being torn down to become new vibrant buildings. We, we deliberately didn't do a historic district because we wanted that vibrancy. So the map to some extent managed that. The theme residential, the transitional residential should be make it easy to tear down and rebuild, but the brick building is not so much. And is the point to not get as much to CBA, not to bog them down, or so that the applicant doesn't have to jump to the two of the CBA? It's mostly the yeah. latter. Okay. Yeah. And, and, um, because we want to, we want to encourage, because we think that we can create a form-based code that spells out more of that in order to facilitate um, redevelopment or reuse or new use of, of property. We only get, I mean, we're talking about that term, an average of one new building a year. So it's not a workload issue for the board. Is there a way to discourage, and maybe that's the answer to no, but uh, to discourage people suing for the special permit? Like suing against? No, that's true. Yeah. Right, yeah. Sam. Yeah. 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 Right. So we just have to take it away. It's public process. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we do everything. Until we control it until we don't have a permit process. Yeah. But as soon as it goes to court, we don't write any of those rules and we don't control it. When that, uh, that was very helpful to think about in terms of brick buildings, because really that kind of clarifies right. things for me. I'm thinking of Holly Street and how that ends yeah. kind of right before you get to probably the new art center. Right? Because yeah. the other two buildings right. are brick. And as you move up, there's more brick buildings there. And then you get to the yeah. post office. Yeah. I think just to be clear, because that buildings pop around, so one of the areas right. which would not be CB core is that air tour, I guess it's that an Elks building on the corner of Center and Masonic that's oh, been empty yeah. for 20 years. Yeah. That would not be the area, though I personally like that building. Yeah. You know, it's torn down. I've often wondered about that building, right. so that's one of his too, huh? Yeah, are there ways, I mean, as part of this thing, uh, to... Well, actually... Oh, said it. Okay. Yeah, <laughs> All right, bad example. Oh, but I'm sure there's some great buildings that aren't. So that would be right, right here. Right yeah. I would hope so, yeah. The, the, you can give tax incentives for to follow, you know, let's say well, the higher actually, yeah, it's out. It's right there. To give right. tax incentives to do... Uh, to follow a stricter aesthetic code? We could, in theory, it's probably, I mean, is the uh, tax increment financing is the mechanism for tax incentives, and it's really written around economic development incentives more than that. But because that's, to me, like, a, a way, like, if we're trying to, if we're trying to expand this and have a certain aesthetic and have yeah. that appearance, that there's a Huge cost to that as well. And to a certain extent, we, we have to have a bare minimum. But I'm wondering if part of is part of it is we, if we're going to have the, some ability to have these special permits, and we also have a tax incentive thing right. where someone could take advantage of these things to make their place. 
I can't more agree. A more agree. really big lift for um, and, and what we tend to do even for tax increment financing is for economic development, there's some state setups that only work if the city's willing to put skin in the game. So we give actually very small tax incentives just enough to leverage state money. And so, you know, a 5% reduction in property tax isn't going to encourage the big investors, but it helps economic development because then you get state money. Okay. But, the but that time, that uncertainty at the beginning is rather bigger. Yeah. yeah, I mean, the other thing is, um, I think this, the, we, we've had these guidelines out for 20 years. We've had some great projects, and we've also had better projects because of the guidelines. So I'm not sure that the guidelines in and of themselves are deterring people from doing a project. Um, what I think we know is the problem, because right. the, 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 some people walk away, so we don't know. Right. But, you know, I mean, I give this example because it, it always bothered me when the city was pushing back on the guidelines. So when the police station was being proposed, yeah. <laughs> Chief Sankowitz was on the building committee at the time, and um, they came to some Chris Architecture Committee, and the committee said, this is terrible, <laughs> basically. You need to go back to the drawing board. And, you know, he was really distraught that he, this was making the cost of the police station go up dramatically. And in the end, I mean, it was built, and he got, you know, he moved in, and then he was very happy with the way it looked, and the community was happy with the way it looked. And so I think that was a, that was a good example of a win for the, you know, first of all, I think the city should be, you know, leading oh, the way on, right. and, <laughs> instead of, you know, pushing back right. on them. Um, but, uh, so I think it's important anyway, even if the guidelines weren't there, the city should be doing the right thing. Um, but that was an example of a project that really was made better because the guidelines were there. Well, it's interesting, and Senior Center, which was not such a good story, actually, like that was this board, but when they were running out of money, they wanted to drop the atrium. It's not that it's the most gorgeous building in the world, but without that atrium, it would be really important. No. And you guys said that. The cupola? The, yeah. the cupola, yeah. Cupola. yeah. Um, the other project that always comes to my mind is the big empty space opposite the Florida Savings Bank next to Foster Ferrar. Right. And that would be Gateway. The old Honda. The old Honda. Yeah. Now, and we don't think developers are staying away from that because of the current you know, that, that's guidelines. A, that's an individual seller who thinks that's it's worth more than it is. Exactly. So, yeah. yeah. Because I know we ran into a lot of pushback during that rezoning of King Street right. or the guidelines around having buildings built up close to the street and parking in the back. Yeah. Well, don't forget the board approved a permit for the redevelopment of that site. Maybe you, maybe well, that was no, even that. Florence, 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 the same thing. So, right. Right. And then a the recession hit. Right. Yeah. So right. 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 Commercial on the first floor. Yeah. Commercial on the first floor. Can we just agree that not a lot of eight hundred feet they think is going to be in this building? Um, and that's a weird That's a shopping. That's a real mall. It's still a still right? That's the mall. The mall best. Yeah. It's originally a grocery store. That price comes. So. So do you do you get a better enough of a sense of these? boundaries to feel like this is a good starting point to say this makes sense to divide it in this way and then I, we can give you more detail about I, excuse me I, I for one trust how it's proposed to be shrunken but I'd like I'd like just more information on like the, the Gothic Street one you said well this is this is why we stopped at the brick building okay that makes sense to me right. but all these other little pockets like south of Main Street, why is that pocket divided? You know, it actually might be worth either doing a virtual tour, you know, count and turn on the buildings and something like this, or a physical tour. Because the, the honest answer is there was no magic. This yeah. is like, we looked at the air photo, they looked at the air photo, we talked together. And so I don't think we're saying this is exactly the right boundaries, we're saying it's the beginning. Yeah. So we really worth going on every we, single we, yeah, yeah, we've done things on it too. Like, okay, so like call outs, like, yeah, like, like Silver Skate, you know, like going right. over Silver Skate. Right. 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 Pizza, what's the pizza place on Pleasant Street? Where is that? Yeah. Uh, no, not Mimo's, the uh, no, Roberto's. Roberto's. Where is Roberto's in the comparison to the Um, It's right, right here. Okay. Yeah, I think that, that would just help 
me yeah. a lot. Do, do you want to do it as a virtual thing or do you actually physically want to do a tour? I'm up for a tour. We've done the walk yeah, That's a lot of walking out. Yeah. I think the good will oh, work. We can oh, get the electric bikes. Oh, right. oh, we can ride around on electric bikes. Look at you. That's You're there we go.
just it's just sustainable Northampton still is a living document. Yes. Right. And it has two, two totally different scales. Mm. One is it helps guide a lot of stuff that we do. It is still sort of viable. We look at it, you know. Um, Applicant can help for all the time. Well, yeah. But that's the second piece is right. it is a special permit. This, the plan by definition is a special permit criteria. So that's where it is teeth. Everywhere else is just advisor. It actually has teeth. Um, so just in terms of Dorgan, you know, a lot of places talk about climate adaptation. We've used resiliency to run this longer, this better word. We want to be resilient to everything, not just about climate, but eventually about education systems and everything else. And then climate mitigation is about reducing greenhouse gases. We want to do regeneration because we want to do more than just about greenhouse gases. It's about conservation areas are being overwhelmed by invasive plant species. You know, because of climate change, but it's not just about reducing greenhouse gases. Um, the plan, like every other plan, has sort of two scales. It goes deep in the weeds and things that 20 people in the world have ever read and they guide us on a few specific actions. But then it creates a framework, but we hope it's still a framework 20 years from now, 30 years from now. So that framework includes things like, as part of this process, the mayor pledged for us to be carbon neutral by 2050. We don't want that to be a hollow pledge. So we're actually looking, what does that mean? What are all the steps that it takes to actually get us there? And that includes popular steps like everyone should drive electric cars and non-popular steps like densification in downtown. So we have more people who can walk in on drive places. So that's all part. So there's a lot of overlap with this. So that's sort of the framework piece. Major framework items for us are besides the, the carbon neutral um, at 2050. One of them is thinking about what's called climate budgeting. And this is only like four paragraphs of carbon budgeting. But we don't, you know, I, I have the Office of Planning and Sustainability. In Central Services is an energy and sustainability coordinator. But there's almost a risk when you, when you give departments responsibilities, is that, oh yeah, planning owns carbon reduction, even though everybody doesn't own that. And so the idea of carbon budgeting is, we give a budget to every department in the city to say, here's how much carbon you're allowed to live. We're not ready, this is a five-year process together. But DPW, eventually we should be out of business, right? DPW owns that you're allowed to have so much carbon. You figure out how to get there. You know, schools, have, I mean, et cetera, across the board. So that's sort of one of the major framework items process. Um, and again, some of the details, and, and this is just recommendations, it's not like the mayor signed off on some of these things. But right now we apply for capital uh, expenditures in the city, so this is a non-grant funded expenditure over $10,000 for a durable item for like five years or more. Um, we do, a lens is, what's the cost to maintain it? Are we saving money or losing money? We don't do a lens about carbon. And so carbon is still in a box. It's not coming across city operations. It's a good box. I think we're a great city doing lots of great things. But nonetheless, you know, when we buy a brand new fire truck, it's not part of the conversation. Um, maybe it shouldn't be. But at least we want to have that conversation saying, OK, we're going to exclude the fire truck. Right. Um, and yeah, so that's the, that's my story. So has the DW bought it? <laughs> well, I'm thinking of all the small engines and the procedure that DPW has. Have they bought into this conversation? So the, the way we build these things is slowly. What we're saying is we need to talk about carbon budgeting. And that needs to have, I mean, they've already switched. All their new vehicles for the last five years have been electric or hydro. We're not doing, and they've looked, and so far they're not good options for really big trucks. They're still diesel and they just don't exist on the market. Or lawnmowers as battery operated, yeah. or yeah. Or but they used right. to like recycle, like when a when a police car right. was recycled, it would go to Louis, you know, the building inspector's department, and it was this old, you know, gas guzzling thing. Now those are cycled out, and, and all new cars are energy efficient or hybrid or electric and so forth. So I don't think there's a resist. I mean, yes, huge opposition, including from me, if we say this applies tomorrow. But if we're moving forward, I mean, school buses are a good example. Technology has now gotten there for school buses if you're willing to spend an extra fifty thousand dollars. Right. It hasn't even gotten there if you want to buy a you know a, a bulldozer. Right. Um, and so a lot of that's why I said these are the long term, these are thirty or forty year things. Um, and then the, the last framework part which DPW is is what we're calling the hand designs of nature, is how do we do more natural systems for our drainage? Yeah. Um, and again, it's not the solution for everything. You know, we're looking at 
the flood control bike that surrounds downtown. And we're probably going to spend a million dollars on this. That's not a design to nature. Right. But, you know, we're also applying for a grant to name or not get it. The ice pond off Route 66 is a more work than the ice pond, so it doesn't flood over Route 66. So at least as that test of where we think about hard type solutions, can we look at soft stuff first? Are, are, are we patterning this off of our, are there any towns our size in the country that are, that are five years ahead of us in this program? The problem we, we have for Northampton, at least my thing is, I think we are one of the leaders in the country for what are basically moderate income communities. There are communities doing 100 times more than we are, but they're like the Cambridges, right? Cambridge money's unlimited, right? Um, so there's not as many models as you think. We're certainly sharing, I'm a member of what's called the uh, Urban Center Directors Network, and we as a network have done these high impact practices. What are the things that make the most amount of impact? Yeah. So, you know, our informal model is stealing from each other since 2008. <laughs> so we're certainly looking yeah. at individual models, but not full plans. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I just want to read some frankly, I don't claim to be an expertise in stuff. So we, the reason we hired outside consultants was to bring in some of those voices that, that we don't have. So with those outside, like the, the, the cities you hear about, like the Adams, Nashville, the Broadway, yeah. those, those small issues seem to be comparable. Are you supposed to look forward to that user needs to revitalize town centers? Yes, yeah. And I was just yeah, in Ann Arbor for last year yeah. on the yeah. National Science Foundation collecting planning practitioners and researchers on what are the cutting edge, what are the research needs. And I was sort of stunned by all the stuff I thought he's been located in the literature. Nobody. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay. So this is the next iteration of what we got like eight weeks ago, right? Well, it's really? like amazingly. It's like leaps and bounds different from yeah. that. Yes. Yeah, it's yeah. great. So this yeah. is the, and our consultants have done, we paid them off. Yeah. So they're out of it, and we can, and, and I would like to move this forward, but because the grant's done, there's no timeline. Yeah. So this is like the form based code, you know, we'd love you to say move forward. Right. What I'm looking for, I don't want any action in. We still need to go, because it's going to be part of our comprehensive plan, that means you have to hold one more public hearing. Mm -hmm. But I don't want to do a public hearing until I sort of get a chance for you all to think about it, right. yeah. give as much feedback as possible, right. and then we'll go ahead. And we don't do about public hearings during the summer anyway. But so I read it, and, and like from the last version, like it's wonderful. The, the, I had a couple tiny things that I'll just send my email, okay. but like the biggest gap for me is I, I'm looking for like a vulnerabilities matrix that is that link between that high level what is climate change? Yes, we're going to see wetter, wets, drier, dries, hotter, hots, colder, colds, and then all of these strategies. And what, you know, I was looking for that one concise. This is what it actually means for Northampton. Okay. It means that we have frost heaves and our roads are going to start cracking, and it means that we're going to have this proliferation of mosquitoes, or it means that you know, like specifically, like what are our vulnerabilities that that get. Like, I think that's what helps people understand yeah, right. why this is important. And then I think some of that is referenced in the text of some of the strategies, like, because there's a lot of good background yeah. text, but pulling that out into one place where it's like, this is this is why we have yeah. all these strategies, because this is what it means for Northampton. That would be, okay. that was kind of the one big so We can definitely thing. do that. So, you know, we can, so, so here's the two documents we're drawing. Here's yeah. the municipal vulnerabilities program, mm -hmm. the state funded piece, right. and we hired, um, Human impact partners to look at the health impacts. Mm -hmm. This is one of those research teams. When we ask health human impact partners, for example, yeah. how many more Lyme disease things we get, and they said there's no way to give you a number. So, as a um, right. quantitative thing, I can't do it as a qualitative thing. I can't. Yeah, I don't think. It, I mean, I don't think it even needs to be all that quantitative. Just you know, there's there's the high level like. There's that whole section like, what is climate change? And I think that's really important for people yeah. who are coming into this now in 2019 new that's fine but you know just a little bit more of like this is what it looks like we, okay. this is this is why we care because there's but that's and a lot of that stuff was in the vulnerability the useful vulnerability even the health piece right yep. we had the the mosquito borne illnesses right. and they um you know we didn't have we didn't have quantification necessarily right. that but Yes, all of a sudden we have Zika now. We right. Have right. So yeah, like there's that early section that has some of those 
there's a bunch of charts and graphs that are really good about precipitation and about, you know, like broadly like regional temperatures and stuff like that. And so it's just, it's like just that one extra like 10 bullets that are like, here's what you're going to see in our community and this is why all these strategies flow from there. Yeah, that, that, that's not a huge ask. Okay. The other thing is you, this is a total sidebar for just so you know. So we do, well, the other plan to adopt every five years, I think, is a FEMA multi-hazard mitigation plan. Mm -hmm. It is the most boring thing we do, and the only document we never look at once it gets adopted. <laughs> it just makes us eligible for lots of FEMA money. Mm -hmm. um, it expires a year from now, and so we're going to have to revise that, yeah. and we're trying to pick how do we use it the way that we do actually look at it, how do we bring it into this process. When I'm looking at the action plan, yeah. Which is great, you know, things like transportation, human experience, education, and and who implements these? It's almost all the planning and sustainability yeah, staff. Yeah, right? yeah. 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 Our, our energy <laughs> officer said it's all on him. Our energy officer looked at it and said, "Great, I have to get a staff now." <laughs> yeah, uh, it's a lot of work. There's some great, great recommendations. Uh, yeah. Well, that's, that kind of happened after sustainable Run too. Yeah. Really, you know, all the action items. Oh, plan. Right, right, right. <laughs> yeah. 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 Um, Just want to make sure we have the plan. <laughs> well, one thing that really worries me about moving forward, you know, 20 years from now, is our reliance on uh, the network of all things, the internet. Does this speak at all to our resiliency or our, our kind of fallback plans on that? Yeah, it's a good question. I, don't yeah. think I mean, the downside is that it's all broadcast. You know, we don't have public internet network. You know, it's it's like let's cross our fingers that Comcast has their act together for when storms start knocking out lines and public internet. That'd be amazing. Yeah. Well, you know, there's been some. You can still be relying on a privately owned backbone right. to get into that. Yeah. Right. Right. It's interesting because I guess that was the one thing that like, PG&E and California has done pretty well, is update those components of the system. From the earthquake, because I, I heard them talking about this relative to yeah. like earthquakes, yeah. is that they, oh. is, they were just talking about these earthquakes, is that that system, yeah. it has just been updated. And I don't know if there's money for it. They weren't burned. <laughs> you know, so, so it's just, PG&E has updated those things, and then, I guess a number of private companies and it just continue to be updated. There's probably yeah. money in them. I mean, there's no money in the county that burned down. Right. Right. Now there is. Hi, Jesus. Yeah. We can mention it's not something I have any expertise in, so I'm just sort of yeah. saying we should be monitoring this. Uh, all right. Right. Yeah, and might be under this last one under health and safety. I'm not sure where it comes in. Um, oh, you yeah. know. You know, we had this process, I don't know how many years ago, Wayne, it was, where we did this continuity of yeah. governance. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I could see, and, and so that kind of trailed off, and now we're sort of working on, I mean, that was sort of a broader outside of planning. Yeah. Stuff, but I can, I sort of see that as um, a link as well, that even if the backbone is, you know, um, out of our control public, at least if it's a duplication of Whatever, whatever little service Comcast provides. Well, there was a study that planning wasn't part of, so I don't know the details about. So we're not, you know, our jobs prevent disasters, but we're not doing things during disasters. Right. We get to go home. We don't get to go home. Right. 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 But there was this effort to sort of look at those things, including communication systems. And I'm not sure where that was or what the conclusions were. And I guess the question is for this plan, like. What is the risk that that, that 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 system is going to be affected by climate change impacts? Do you know what I mean? Like, so it's sort of like, right, it, right. you know, is it that there's random disasters, or is it that we're we're making a link between increased storm activity yeah. and then loss of internet connectivity? But like, if that link is not that strong, it doesn't need to be in this plan per se. But it is something we need to be thinking about. Yeah. Um, so my other question might be in your in your introduction, you mentioned that. Our uh, sustainability plan was a little bit weak because the measures were hard to kind of maybe verify. So, what are the measures for this kind of plan? Is it only that, say, for instance, 
you have on uh, page 80, we have a, a regeneration curriculum in the public schools. Yeah. So the measure is going to be by the year 2025, 20, public schools will have a curriculum. Yeah, it's not that goal. We didn't do a lot of quantification. We did too many of them in the process. The okay. only real quantification is that um, carbon neutral by 2050. Uh, nothing else is really there. So what we did for Sustainable in Hampton is we switched to STAR, figuring that would be across the board. STAR now expires. We are looking at need for cities as a replacement, because that's a universal thing that people figure out. And I, we haven't sort of, what's the expression? What the bullet? We haven't quite committed to LEAD. You know, if we're going to replace STAR, it's going to be with LEAD. But we haven't, you know, we keep looking at it. I have an intro in the summer. We're sort of looking at how much is really involved. So we haven't totally committed to doing that. If we don't, we need to think about what else we do. So we so some of the lead metrics might overlap or integrate into this resiliency plan? Yeah, but not that level of detail that you're talking about. But you know, enough, because the benefit of using a nationwide norming thing is that thing about comparing to other communities, right? This is what Asheville's doing, and we're doing better or we're doing worse if we compare ourselves. So what is our homework assignment? Um, yeah, Tess has actually read all this. Read every yeah, other yeah. Email me specific comments you have. Yeah. And when do you meet next? Now it's going to be August 8th. We have a ton of permits. OK. So then maybe read enough to send me an email for a couple weeks to say, you're OK with us moving to the next step of the public hearing. So you, you won't lose your chat, chance to make comments, but I hate to just have to have a whole new chat. So right. you know, test this comment about adding more stuff. That's fine at this point. I'd hate to hear that in September. And that's all the commitment I need. And then we're going to public hearing. So it either be September 12th or the end of September, whatever. Yeah. Sense. I think for that one, we and actually the other thing is, you figure out. I mean, there's a requirement that you hold a public hearing. You're allowed to sub it off to other people. So you know, you could have a public hearing on the plan. It's before the planning board or not, I don't care. Um, that's up to you. And, you, and you don't even have to make a decision at that same public hearing. Right. You right. can just take comments and then use another meeting. We did that sort of a sustainable plan. plan. We did that a couple times. We just yeah. got comments. Yeah, because we would take the public comments, we'd send you a revised copy. Right, right. And then you could revise right. that. Right. But I would, you know, my certain, my, frankly, the next step, we're going to ask the Energy Commission to endorse this in August. You know, I want them to be going before the public hearing. Yeah. We're going to ask you to adopt it in maybe October. We'd like to go to council. We should all the council to involve this process. And we're losing all the council. So my only hard deadline is getting to council. We only have one meeting in August? Yes. Yeah. So is everybody by here going to be here for August 8th? Because we have the continuation from Hope, yep. and then we've got a couple more nice ones. I'm actually trying to figure out a joint public hearing. Wait, are you done? Is this yeah. the <laughs> a joint public hearing August 8th with the zoning board. So what I might do is start a little bit early, because the zoning board is usually at 5.30. So if we could do a 6.30 meeting and do a joint meeting with zoning board and start at 6.30, that would be helpful because then it sort of is a split yeah. between your two times. Yeah. Um, so on the eighth. Yeah, August eighth. That's my Sixth third. working yep. theory at this point. Yeah. 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 Right. You'll just have to quit work earlier, but you just need to remind me. Okay. Okay. Try to bring myself the shackles in the <laughs> Yeah, there was a concert, there was a space back. So it's a management issue. 
have to just have a retainer. And decide which Second. Second. All those in favor? Thank you.